I want to begin by thanking Linda for this opportunity to preach at this Mass for my friend, my colleague in ministry for almost 20 years, a man who was in many ways a conscious voice to me. Dick and I did not always agree on everything. But I would want to know what he thought about things. And we may not have arrived at the same place, but his spirituality, his understanding, did shape the way this community responded in many ways. And it affected the leadership that I offered this community. And so I begin by extending my sympathy to, to Linda, Dick's wife for so many decades, to Jessica and Albert and Jordan and Leah and Dan and Elise at a distance, Sister Cindy and her family, for Deacon Dennis, for friends and colleagues I hear. I see people from Ellicottville here, of course his beloved Filipino community, the RCIA team, his support group among the deacons, our parish community, the community of St. Philomena's, and especially the diocesan diaconate community. We are grateful for your presence here today and last evening. And I want to just acknowledge that we received condolences from Father Joe Perpilia. Uh, Joe is studying in Europe, could not be here. Uh, Father Ed Chidi, previous pastor at St. John's, uh, he is covering for a priest who is having some medical issues. Tom Quinlevin, the former pastor here, told Sister Regina to please extend his condolences. Uh, my dear friend James Snodgrass, the rector of St. Stephen's Episcopal Church, could not be here. He is on retreat in a monastery on the Hudson River. Must be nice. And I understand, Father Pat, there's even been a mass in the Carmelite Chapel in Estero, Florida. Talk about must be nice. Yes, thank you for doing that. Now my task, of course, is to reflect on the readings and then after communion, uh, Jessica and Father Tony may have a word as well. But two other comments before my prepared text. Sister Jean said to me, the other night, you didn't make it through another November. In my ministry here, in your ministry here, November is always the month that we suffer the most. And so we do again. There's a litany of folks who have died, and they're well known in this community. Some young, some old. November, again and again and again. And so we gather here. Perhaps it's always a good preparation for Advent. But on a lighter note, we have to acknowledge that we always teased Dick about being late. Now, Linda worked with us on this too. Um, we really tried hard, but he was habitually, chronically, a last-minute arrival. And we teased him, of course, that he was going to be late for his own funeral. Now, how clever was he? Being waked in the church, he was the first one here. So, um, and I suspect during the night, the only visitor he had was the perennial bat in the bell tower up there. He always makes an appearance at this time of year uh, just so you know, Father Pat, usually it's on Christmas Eve, and the kids even call him the Christmas bat, and, and sometimes they think, Father David can test to this, that this is deliberate, that we have one in the belfry that we let out on Christmas Eve. <laughs> he may have visited Dick last evening. So it is on the cusp of Advent, and if you saw Dick in the casket, he is dressed in his purple dalmatic and the Poinsettias are a deliberate touch. The giving tree is all set. Advent is a wonderful season, much beloved by priests and deacons, 
most of us admit, and I think I've heard Dick say this as well, favorite season, great preaching opportunities, people come to church in greater numbers, there's more poignancy. Uh, but Advent is one of those sophisticated seasons with a great deal of subtlety as well. Ambivalence and ambiguity as a moment is like this. Advent is one of those seasons, yes, but not yet. Jesus coming, yes. Jesus has come, Jesus is here, but not yet. And the ambiguity certainly is that Dick has had his Advent moment for Jesus coming. But for the rest of us, rest of us it's a not yet experience. On to the readings. After the attack on the Tree of Life Synagogue in Squirrels Hill, you know of the tragedy, I was asked to speak in our own community here at the memorial service at Temple Benai, Israel. And to prepare for that, I, I learned about the victims of that attack, like the Rosenberg brothers and Dr. Rabinovich, one of the first uh, young physicians to care for AIDS patients in our country. And I began to reflect on my own journey with the Jewish community. And I remember back in my college days, and Dick probably had the same experience, uh, for those that were involved in religious stuff at the time, you had to read Heim Potok's books. I think of particularly The Chosen. It's a wonderful little story about a very, very traditional Hasidic rabbi and his young son, Danny. Now, I'm not going to give you the whole details. I want you to read the book. But Danny, the young son, is the heir apparent. But Danny really has in his heart another desire. He doesn't want to be the rabbi. He wants to become a psychiatrist. And he convinces his father to let him do that. And there was a great deal of discontent in the community because the elders came and said, how can you allow this? How can you allow this to happen to your son? How can you allow him to follow such a path? And the rabbi spoke one sentence. And to their credit, when Hollywood did this story, they didn't change a word. The rabbi got up and said, My son is Sadak. And everyone was quiet. Sadak. The first reading talks about Sadak. The just one, that's what it means. The just one, even though he died early, has not accumulated wealth and riches and degrees and all sorts of things, is beloved of God. And that's what the rabbi was saying about his son. My son has godly relationships. He loves the Most High. He is devoted to his family. He understands his responsibilities to the community, to the sick, to the broken, even to his enemies. And like the rabbi in the story, I proclaim to you, Richard Matthews, is Sadak. And that's enough to be said. I love that Linda chose Paul's letter to the Corinthians. We hear this so often at weddings. It's lovely to hear it more and more at funerals. Here's Paul, the preeminent Pharisee, someone who really understands Sadakah. He knows what's right. And he comes to this Corinthian community. We don't have time to, for a lesson, and there's children in the crowd, so I can't tell you the whole story. But the Corinthian community was a little loosey-goosey, you know. Uh, little loosey-goosey in their relationships. And Paul comes in and challenges them to be sadakim, to be righteous in their important relations, right with God and right with those they love. And he said, in effect... That you become Sadak when you open your heart and love. 
when you pour out your heart in love. And as I remind couples, month after month, when I served as your pastor, it's in the little ways. It's not in the big moments of prophecy, in the big moments of miracles. Well, those come along eventually, but they will happen if there's all those little moments before of patience and tenderness and kindness. We remember that. That Dick was Sadak in his love for Linda and for Jessica and Leah and Jordan, for Elise. As a brother, as a friend to the deacons, especially Dennis, as a neighbor, I see neighbors here, the task, the mystery, the joy of being faithful, of living life in goodness, is in the little ways that we attend to one another. And Dick was Sadak and his wider relationships. It's so appropriate that we hear about the Beatitudes because Dick was a Beatitude person and he loved Beatitude people who are Advent people. Yes, but not yet. Those who are grieving, they will know joy. Yes, but not yet. Those who are broken will be healed. Those who are poor will be blessed. Those who seek mercy will find mercy. Yes, but not yet. And so you know Dick. His heart was with the poor, especially immigrant families, the strangers, the homeless, the folks at Genesis House, the folks at the Olean Food Pantry, the kids who were bullied in school, and the kids who did the bullying, and those who were lost and needed a high school guidance counselor to set them on the right path, or those at JCC who weren't sure where they should go from here. He was there. And he was one who cared for those who were dissed. The disillusioned, the discouraged, the disenfranchised, the dismissed, the disregarded, and even the disheveled, including his old pastor. And he would fix me up, as he did on Sunday morning, making sure I was not as disheveled as I might have been. And sometimes this meant, we need to be candid about this, that his politics were not your politics. Right, Linda? You got that right. And some of you were upset with some of the things he said and some of the things he put on his Facebook. But he was concerned about those who were hurting. And I got all sorts of complaints, even from the priest. That deacon is too political. That deacon loves the poor, the broken, the disenfranchised. Understand that, that he's there as a beatitude voice for the Advent people who understand yes, but not yet. So a Sadat. Now I know many of you have favorite images from your literary experiences. That's one of the challenges, Patrick and Romy, of this congregation. It is a well-read congregation. And so they'd like literary references and clarifications over and over again. Now, some of that comes, of course, from the university. And some of that comes from our own lived experiences with Dick and myself. And so I'm sure you all have a favorite character in some of the plays that are famous. I I'm sure Dick did. I, I know from experience that Father Tony does. Take Julius Caesar. Who's your favorite character in Julius? You all read it in high school. I had to read it twice in college. Who's the favorite character? You know, in my case, it's not Brutus or Julius or Mark Anthony. It's Brutus's servant, Lucius. Lucius. And, and the exact text goes like this. Brutus says... Get me a taper in my study, Lucius. When it is lighted, come and call me there. So Lucius, whose name is a clue to his task, brings light to Brutus and, and other evidence. You know, I'm not telling you the story. Other evidence and motivation that provoked 
an episode that changed history. Brutus bringing the light. Dick Matthews was a Brutus. Not Brutus, was a Lucius. Got to get this straight. He was a Lucius. He was a light bringer. And he brought light and insight and clarity to so many ways in his classroom. Whether he was teaching English or Latin or philosophy, in his counseling sessions, in his career planning with his young people, as a copy reader for Father Anthony, clarifying. That's what he did. That's an important role that this man undertook and did it well. In his homily this past Sunday, he clarified why Jesus was king and why we needed Jesus to be our king. As he did week after week, asking us to see Christ in the people that Dick loved and allowing Christ to transform us so that we would love those people too. Clarifying. In his baptisms, he had two baptisms this weekend, this past weekend. What does he say? Receive the light of Christ. Parents and godparents, this light is really entrusted to you. Lucius, the light bringer. And clarifying, finally, in his movement. Now, I was going to suggest that Dick was kind of a liturgical dancer, but that would really be stretching it. <laughs> really. He had a little bit of a deacon waddle sometimes. <laughs> There were a few people that even said that out loud. There's the deacon waddling down the aisle. It was his physical structure. But movement. Just as you saw the deacon, Tom, pick up the book and bring it up here and actually hold it up for you to see. That movement. It's a deacon movement. It's a light-bringing movement. And Dick would carry the book in procession. At the Easter vigil, he would leave the catechumens around the church. It was kind of a liturgical dance. Just like this. A little liturgical dance. But drawing attention and letting people notice it. A minister in his movement. Every year, three poignant moments. At the, at the Christmas proclamation, at the Big Mass on Christmas Eve, the church would be darkened. And we'd be in the sacristy and there'd be a flashlight. And of course, Dick would just be getting on his Delmatic. Uh, it was so 10.01 or something like that. He's getting on the Delmatic, a little out of breath. We say, it's your turn. All the lights are down. Flashlight goes on and he's got his microphone and he reads the Easter proclamation and then processes out into the crowd and all the lights come on and the place is aglow. Or at Tenebrae, which we celebrate here traditionally on Good Friday. Now this was one that he could always like because we tried to make it as poignant as we could, but his role was at the very end. So he didn't have to be here on time he could go in and he would come from the back and come forward. And he would bring forward the old Paschal candle. After the tomb was closed and the church in total darkness, Dick would bring forward that candle. But it's yes, but not yet. So as he would get to where he is right about there, candle would go out because it's not time to proclaim it yet. The gesture. And then of course the obvious one, the Easter vigil. When he would come forward and we did it in a variety of configurations here and in other places but he was always a part of it. Coming forward and bringing the Lumen Christi. The light of Christ. His liturgical dance Statements of his Lucius understanding that as a man who is Sadak and a man by ordination who is Lucius and by practice as a liturgical dancer proclaimed the power of God's love and that it would always be his place to serenade the Easter candle. And so I'm going to end simply with 
these words of serenade taken from the end of the Exulta. Therefore, O Lord, we pray th that you bless this candle, hallowed to the honor of your name. May this candle persevere undimmed to overcome the darkness of this night. Receive it as a pleasing fragrance and let it mingle with the lights of heaven. May this flame be found still burning by the morning star, the one morning star who never sets, Christ your Son, who coming back from death's domain has shed his peaceful light on humanity and lives forever and reigns forever and ever. May the words of this prayer be fulfilled now in the life of Richard Matthews and his journey to God. For being Sadak, for being Lucius, for dancing and leading on the way.